first interest was just as soon as I started to read. My mother read me fairy tales, and I loved the fairy tales, and I especially loved the um, <clears throat> the depressing fairy tales like Oscar Wilde's, you know, and also um, Hans Christian Andersen's Match Girl. But I loved the um, the Happy Prince by Wilde, and so I started reading dark stories as a child, um, or been or having them read to me. Um, I got more involved in reading them uh, as a teenager, I guess. I read H.P. Lovecraft. I loved Richard Matheson's um, Shock series, his stories. Um, he had Shock, Shock 2 and something else. And I loved um, Twilight Zone. I mean, to me that was usually dark. And I grew up with the original Twilight Zone series. So I loved that and I loved Outer Limits and One Step Beyond. And, and then Thriller, I think it was called. Thriller Theater or Chiller Theater with Boris Koloff um, introducing it. So my whole life I'd been interested in horror. Um, it seemed, although my career started as a, mostly as a science fiction editor at Omni Magazine, I was always interested in buying short stories that were dark also and it overlapped with science fiction. Um, I became more of a horror editor to keep the anthologies I was editing separate from the anthologies, from the science fiction I was buying for Omni. So in a way it was deliberate, deliberately a career decision to keep the conflict of interest apart from my regular job. Traditionally, women wrote a lot of horror, but it wasn't called horror in the 40s and 50s. Um, the, they were gothics. I mean, there was a whole bunch of women writers, mostly, the field in fact was dominated by female writers, the short story um, field. I'm not an expert at that at all, but there were many collections that have been brought out from Ashtree Press and uh, other small presses that have been bringing out those gothic women. But there does seem to be a dearth of female horror writers from say the 60s to the 90s, or maybe even now. Um, <clears throat> there are many more women writers getting into horror fiction, I think, now. There are many female writers who write science fiction, fantasy, and horror. For example, Elizabeth Hand, Pat Cadigan. Um, I'm thinking of people who write in all the, you know, over the, all the genres. Joyce Carol Oates, of course. Um, so there are many more women horror writers, but not, still not as many as men. And I'm not sure, it may be that what they were writing were not, was not called horror. Certainly in the Gothic, in that certain period where the Gothic was king, there were more women writers, I think, than male writers. So it may be perception as much as actuality. Well, looking for a good story, it doesn't matter what genre it's in. I mean, of course, I'm reading, when I'm reading for an anthology, or a magazine, if I'm working for a magazine, I want certain types of fiction. But a good story has elements of, you know, it's the tone, it's the interesting tone, it's the point of view, it's the characterization, it's the description, um, the plot, the story. For me, too many horror stories don't have real stories. When I read, I mean, I read a lot of horror short fiction, and my biggest complaint is that there's no story. It's just an incident. It just this is what's happening, but there's nothing around it. There's no real story, so you don't care about what happens in the story. So to me, uh, there needs to be an element of actual storytelling. But the best stories have all of those elements, you know. So you can get a you can get by with atmosphere if you're good enough, or if the atmosphere or the background is interesting enough. But to have all of those things working, clicking at the same time, then you've got a great story. And that's for not only for horror. I think. Writers who want to start selling in the horror field need to be aware of what came before. Not just King, but before King. I mean, some people think horror started with Stephen King, and that's just not so. So you need, I'm not saying you have to read every book and every story published since the dawn of mankind, which horror was being published from the very beginning. I mean, there are horror stories in the Bible. There are horror stories, you know, the Odyssey, the Iliad, there's horror in there. Um, but it, be, it helps to know what came before because you'll see that there's not much you can do entirely differently. Or you can do things entirely differently, but the plots are often similar. Um, I think as a writer you should be persistent. If you want to be a writer of any kind, you have to write every day. If you don't write every day, if you don't write and send out your work, 
and then oh, first write your story, rewrite the story, let it sit for a while, reread it and rewrite it, and then send it out, and then you do that with the next story. So I mean, as much as anything else, persistence. Um, of course, talent. Sometimes it's innate. I mean, a lot of it's innate. I mean, there's an innate. <clears throat> um, nat some people are natural short story writers, and some people are not. Some people. In a way, I think you should write first and then figure out which genre you're writing in. I mean, don't say, I'm going to be a horror writer. If you're attracted to writing dark material, then yes, you'll be a horror writer. But I wouldn't force some myself if I was a writer. I'm not a writer at all. I would not force myself into a genre. Um, I mean, think with short fiction, the overlap is much more fluid now. Not necessarily with novels because of marketing and book publishers. But short stories, you can go wherever you want in whatever mode of communication you want. But definitely persistence and uh, seeing what's come before. Self-publishing is more useful for writers who are professional already, who have sold material. The problem, the biggest problem with self-publishing is getting other people to read your work. If no one knows who you are and you come out of nowhere, unless you're very savvy or very lucky, you're not going to sell more than a few copies to your family. Um, I mean, yes, there was, you know, a track record of people who self-published their first books, and yes, they you know, made a lot of money, and that's great. But if you talk to those people, some of them would rather have a traditional publisher, because they basically spend two or three years of their lives riding around in a car selling hand-to-hand -hand books. And that's, as a writer, that's, is that really how you want to spend your time? basically. That's what a publisher should be doing, sending out review copies and all that. So I have nothing against self-publishing per se, although if you do self-publish you really need to get someone to edit you. If you don't edit, have, if you have no, ed, no editor, most, I'd say every writer needs an editor, even if it's a very superficial editor. Um, that's what makes the difference between professional writing and non-professional writing. If you just put something out there and it's totally unedited and, and, and I don't mean copy edited necessarily, although it should be that too. And there's a difference between copy editing and line editing and substantive editing. <clears throat> um, and you need someone who can do all of that, or to, or do different people who can do that. So I think self-publishing is really hard. Um, it's not as easy as everyone thinks, you know, because you need to make an investment financial to get a good cover and personally of your time. So that's what people have to decide. I would try the traditional markets first. If you cannot sell your work and are convinced that it's great, then yeah, go ahead and try, but how are you going to get the attention? You have to figure that out. You have to have a marketing plan. It is a big problem in horror that many stories that I read have no point. Um, I mean, I think I read a story and I think, well, why was that written? I mean, it takes place, it's just an excuse for a scene. It's not storytelling. And to me, that's bad writing. Um, so for me, the worst thing in horror is bad writing because I don't want to read it. You know, it's like, why are you inflicting this on me? You know, learn how to do more than just create an incident or have someone being locked in a room being tortured. This is not a horror story. This is not a story at all. It is an incident and that's it. And to me that's the worst part of horror. Despite what I just said about horror being, there being so much bad writing out there in horror, I actually think this is a golden age for horror short fiction. Um, I never have trouble filling up my 140,000 words in the best horror of the year. I think that over time, in the last 26 years, there have been more and more interesting writers coming into the field from other fields and just from out of the blue who are writing what I consider horror. Now, I have a broad opinion. I have an opinion that horror is broader than what some people think. And some people say, that's not horror. I say, yes, it is. I have my own defi definition of what I consider horror. And to me, it needs to be a creepy thing. It doesn't have to be a splashy, grisly um, shock. I mean, it can be, and that can be great, but that's not the only type of horror there is. There's lots of horror. There's a conte cruel, which is a cruel tale, literally, and um, it's maybe a slice of, it's a, it's a story about a real-life incident, and it's just really nasty. It's cruel, and there's nothing fantastic about it. Of course, there's terror fiction, 
uh, terror tales like Psycho, the original Psycho and uh, the, the book and the, and the movie. Um, that's horror. So there's psychological horror, supernatural horror, um, gothic tales, and I'm not, uh, gothic tales have their own little special differences. I used to be fiction editor of Omni Magazine for 17 years. And after that closed down in 1996 or 7 or 8, I can't remember exactly, from then, then on I worked at home. So being a fr freelancer is a very odd kind of job. Um, people say, oh yeah, you've got all this free time. Yes, but I work more, I, I work less and more than anyone else <laughs> who has a full-time job. I don't take my weekends off. If I want to do, I mean, I may take the middle of the day on a Monday off, but then I may be working all weekend doing reading. I'm, mostly I'm reading, contacting, edit, uh, contacting writers if I have a project going on, uh, editing. So it totally depends. I mean, I, my day is not a typical day for anybody, I don't think. Yeah, it's like, and I have very bad hours, so. Um, but a lot of, much, <clears throat> I'd say most of my working life is taken up, is taken up reading, my reading, which I enjoy. If I didn't, I wouldn't be in, be an editor. I currently have a f couple of books coming out. <clears throat> the Best Horror of the Year, number five, is due out, was due out in June, but because Nightshade, my publisher, has kind of been dissolved, um, it's been taken over by Skyhorse. And um, I believe the book will be coming out in the next few months. It's just going into production now. Um, so I'm working on number six, best horror of the year. I've just finished Lovecraft's, um, sorry, Lovecraft's Monsters, which is an all reprint anthology with one original novella um, of stories that have that use one of Lovecraft's creatures. I did previously I did Lovecraft Unbound, which was supposed to be Lovecraft without the tentacles and they were supposed to influence by Lovecraft. Many of the stories in the new book, which is all reprint again, the first one was original, uh, many of the stories, all the stories of course are influenced by Lovecraft, but I do have, they, I, part of the myth was that I wanted their creatures, but they're still very different. And the challenge of doing an anthology like that, there's so many Lovecraftian anthologies out, you want to make sure that you, if you pick a story that for reprint, it hasn't been reprinted already a hundred times. So that was my goal, and that should be coming out from Tachyon next year sometime. Um, most recent book is Queen Victoria's Book of Spells, which is a Victorian fantasy anthology that I co-edited with Terry Winding from Tour, Tour Books, and Hauntings, which was an old reprint anthology of ghost stories from Tachyon. I'm currently working on um, Fearful Symmetries, which is an anthology, an all original, non theme horror anthology that was kickstarted last year, uh, early this year. And I'm working on that with Chai Zine Publications, a Canadian publisher. And the reason I did a kickstarter was because non theme, not only horror, but non theme anthologies are very difficult to sell these days to publishers. And so um, we, I decided, well, this would be a good experiment. So we got what we needed, and I'm currently reading the stories. Um, we had an op Usually my anthologies don't have open reading periods, uh, but this one we did for a month from May 1st to May 31st, and we got 1,081 submissions. So I'm not the only person, I'm not reading the most of the submissions, we have readers who will pass on the stories to me. So that book, and I have the stories are starting to come in from the solicited writers. And those stories are coming in um, now, and I have to hand the book in in September, so that should be out next year also. You know, and I have a couple of other, oh I know, oh, I have a couple of original anthologies I will not talk about, but I do have a reprint anthology that I had opened up to the public um, on movie horror stories. And it's called The Cutting Room, and Tachyon's publishing it, and it's uh, more than, I have more than three quarters of the stories now, and they're all reprints. You know, from maybe 25 years, but most of them are newer than that. So that's what I'm up to right now.